Thank you, Suzanne and her panel. They've all been issued with the regulation mittens. No cold hands tonight. Uh, we're entering the final chapter of today's uh, discussions, but I, I don't know what all that fuss was about the uh, lights earlier on. I mean, we're at Ziemo Blasma. That was, I assume, the Northern Lights. Admittedly, a little bit less spectacular than I'd been led to believe. It happens about once every two hours, I think, in Latvia. Uh, now we have our final uh, closing keynote speaker. It's uh, Viestus Tselminch from Latvia. Uh, he's described here as a socio-anthropologist and urbanist. Some ists, which I'm not quite sure what they mean, but hopefully he will, he will um, supply the answers. And the note here says that it, he'll be talking about bringing creativity in to preserve what you have inside already. Though, importantly, there's a TBC in brackets after that. I don't know many socio-anthropologists, but I've got a feeling they might change their mind and talk about something completely different if the mood so takes them. So, uh, while he's talking as well, uh, listen carefully and continue sending the uh, Slido uh, questions, and uh, I'm sure it will be provocative enough that at the end we'll want to ask him some questions if we've got time. So, Viestus, Natsman leads. Nice to meet you. It's all yours. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, pleasure to see you here today. Uh, it's now my easy task to pick up the audience at 5 p.m., that's pretty quite exciting for everyone to, to address. Uh, I'm myself an anthropologist, uh, but anyway, can anyone hear me? Great, at least half of you are not asleep. Good, so I'm myself an anthropologist. Uh, I work in urban planning, and es uh, especially on placemaking, on how do we make uh, random abstract spaces into places we'd like to visit, work, or live, or have fun at. So today we're going to speak about three things. Number one, we're going to speak about icon-led growth. Number two, we're going to speak about network development of how do we turn from cold icons, which are supposed to grow uh, our cities and tourism flows or what have you. And lastly, we're going to address that how to do that. So what should we not do, what we should do, and how we should do that. So first we're going to go through theory, then a bit of practice, and then applied case from Riga. So, let me ask you a question. Of the cities and countries you come from, does any of you have ever heard about iconic buildings that are supposedly garner tourism flows and attract people from all over the place? Any of you have a, an iconic building in your city or area you live? All right. Well, this number is a dismal number about iconic buildings. 78% of the iconic buildings are built on, on uh, budgets that go out of the line and go over the timeline they're supposed to be finished. So this is a kind of a hard fact or hard landing for all the optimists out there that think the iconic building is going to change the city or change the funding or change the tourism flows. Well, this is the reality behind it. And if you don't obviously believe me, then in an area of... Uh, alternative facts. You can go to uh, Ben Flipberg and Oxford University and he's done the hard work compiling uh, uh, 15 years of research of how Olympics and iconic buildings and all these mega towers actually uh, don't deliver either money or growth. So let's go through three cases which demonstrate a bit of that, of how iconic buildings actually are most of the time failure, dismal failure, dismal financial failure, dismal planning failures. But this is National Popular Music Center in Sheffield. And good thinking at beginning, as usual, post-industrial degraded area, which is not attractive to either workers or, uh, or people or tourists, nothing. So they thought, well, what Sheffield? What Sheffield is good, good for? Well, Sheffield is known for music. Jarvis Cocker, the pulp. Um, Phil Collins, they all come from Sheffield, so what are we going to do? We're going to make a music center that re represents the history and heritage in the Sheffield. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, they took two drums from Phil Collins and put them right there. Two drums, uh, which were the, the, the iconic component of the tourism flows are supposed to uh, attract. So uh, instead of three years, the thing was finished in five years, Instead of 9 million, it was 17 million. And instead of 400,000 people it was supposed to attract 
it attracted 100,000 people and it was closed in 11 months, right? And then it went to bankruptcy and then in three years it was sold to local university and it was made into student center. Ta-da! So all the way from music center, which is going to be national popular music center, it ended up in the right where it's supposed to belong, with students, right? Except 17 million for student center. That's quite painful, isn't it? Right, number two, and I'm, I'm not going to be dismal and, and uh, all the way through. So this is Air Center in Yorkshire, uh, an area, again, the, the similar story, post-industrial area, not much happening, not much growth, not much interest in the area. So in the early 90s, they thought, well, how about we think of the, the what's, what's up in the air? What are the people interested in? What's hot and trendy? Where's the, where are the cool kids going? Well, sustainability back in 90s, that was the whole thing. Solar energy, sustainable energy. Earth, we're all hippies. So they thought in Yorkshire, well, how about we make an air center there? So all things devoted to Earth, because we have a lot of pastures and, and green, and, well, we're going to change the scene and the way how we are perceived. Rather, the industrial, we're going to be post-industrial and kind of down to Earth in, in real terms. So it was supposed to be done in six years. It took eight years. It was supposed to be about 23 million, and it was 41 million. Uh, and it was supposed to be at least 160,000 people a year, and it was 30. So in 99, when it was opened, um, it only worked for, only one half of it was open. It was, I think, the sustainability center, so with some kind of research and, and expositions done. And it was closed down again in seven months, and they gave another 50 million to them to build a golf, golf course. Um, uh, and then with the golf course open in two years, it went down the hill again. And then it was sold to local charity, I think, and, and it made the extracurricular activities for schools. So kind of education and schools always pick up the bill. You know, if we, if we don't know what to do with it, well, we just give it to students or, or pupils. But they'll know how to do that. You know, they run around and go crazy about it anyway, except it was uh, quite expensive. Iconic building again. Lastly, this is a, the public. Again, you can go and uh, go to Google and do your own research if you think that I'm, I'm making this up. This is, I think, that the, the, the English, this is, a lot of these are in England, so the English use even more heavy words than I do. You can just check it out. So the public, again, it was in 2000, uh, early 2000, so the idea of, what's again, what's in the air? The internet. That's going to change everything. No need for bread, no need for water. The internet's going to take care of it all. So again, you know, a lot of people will have to learn how to do the internet. So they said, well, the public uh, is going to be addressing the, the, uh, the, the people who need to learn how to do the things on internet. So again, good idea. Community is in the center. The people who learn how to search the web, serve the, serve the zone, etc. cetera. Uh, except it was, an, it was an opened in, 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 again, in several stages of trying to live in, in uh, I think, in two, 2009. Uh, it had gone through three or four renders of how, is it how much is it going to cost from 30,000 or 35 to 50, and then it got to 20, and by the time it's open, the yearly cost of running this thing was 1.6 million. So how in the world are you going to be sustainable? You're going to teach people to use internet? So by the time the thing was done, I mean, everyone had a smartphone and on laptop at the home, right? Why would you go to the public and use the you know, internet there for 72 million? Right, so again, I'm, I'm pushing the borders a bit here, but again, this is just my opinion, obviously not just my opinion, that a lot of these things all around the world and globe, and I'm not even touching Olympics, which is just like burning money st standing in, in the shower, uh, is, is spent with so much optimism and so very little hard facts beneath it. And, and not only it wastes money, but also uh, frustrates the public and not to mention no tourists would, would ever want to go there. Does anyone know what this thing is on, 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 on the picture right there? Anyone? Come on, you guys know what this iconic thing is in, in, in the back of it? Right, Bilbao, that's right. Well, I didn't put the usual Google image right there, just give you a bit of an edge there, uh, but I put this young stud, you know, diving in, into, the, into, the, into the water from there. Why do you think that this Red Bull thing is in front of the, the, the picture there? Any ideas? Well, that's a good idea. That's a very down-to-earth, pragmatic answer. Sponsor, what the hell, man? What do you think? Uh, 
in fact, it's, it's the kind of a second season of, of Bilbao. You know, the first wave idea of that one building with, with good planning and good exhibition is, is going to, uh, you know, attract tourists, that actually worked. So this is, we're now going from the darkness to light back again. So this is a decent example, and not for nothing we call it the Bilbao effect, except it's not a Bilbao effect at all. There's only one thing in Europe has worked like that, this Bilbao. Everyone else has done what we thought before. So there's nothing effect of it. It's just one, just absolute anomaly that it, it was not supposed to work. So, but what I have done right, they, they were on time, they, they finished in six years, they spent about 40 hundred, uh, uh, 140 million on it, and it was right about, right about on time. And they, in 10 years, uh, they, they've been gradually getting about 1 mi million people a year. So they're right, right on time. But I think, and, and this has been d addressed in literature quite a bit, the success of Bilbao Effect is not just the architecture itself, even though it's fantastic and scenic and depending on your taste, you like it more or less, but about these things that we, s we see on the picture. It's a network of activities. See, if you go Bilbao, it's not just that one building and without one exhibition, even good as, as it might be. It's about many things that happen there. So these kids that go to the diving festival, that might even not step in their f the foot into the, into the into museum. But now it's a network, an ensemble of activities that you go to Bilbao. And this is the thing that's taken 15 or 20 years to realize for, for cities, for governments, for planning, planning agencies, when people have visit the city, they don't want one thing. So an idea of one iconic building is it's going to sustain the tourism flows or any kind of a placemaking is just dubious. It doesn't work like that. So this is what Bilbao, I think, has done right, and that's why it's called Bilbao, Bilbao Effect, that they've created a network of activities in the winter, in the summer, in the autumn, in, 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 uh, in the spring, so it actually sustains the flows that would go there. So it, that means you know, cafes and restaurants and small gatherings, uh, cultural centers and you know, uh, extreme activities like Red Bull diving and other things that they do, which is a network ensemble of activities that sustains the growth of tourism or even local population that, would, uh, that choose to spend their, their free time in the city. This is Copernicus, another one, so not just to take the uh, contemporary arts. This is a, a, um, um, uh, a creative science center uh, in Poland. And again, you have millions of those all over. Every country has a science center right now or some kind of innovative center for kids, or, uh, or and, 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 and except they didn't start out like that. They didn't start with, with uh, 131 million building. They thought it was as a science picnic. And that's the, that's the very, very, very fundamental. If you take one idea of all of what I'm saying today, take this one away. All of these things absolutely fail. 78%, some people say it's even more than 78% of all these iconic buildings fail, waste money, angry the public, and, and don't make any addition to the city except the builders and, and, and developers. But this one thing is absolutely crucial. Do you have a process rather than a project or building in, uh, at, at, at the very center of it. So Copernicus grew as a prototype, as a model. So it started out as a science picnic that garnered interest from the local population, especially uh, primary schools and, 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 uh, and high schools in the area of STEM. So, so hard sciences, physics, and, and chemistry, and math. So because, because young, young people in, in Poland, like everywhere else, they don't choose to, to, to study hard sciences. They don't want to do that. So the idea of the science picnic was to, how can we make these things interesting? And by now, it's 2018, everyone knows that this is the way you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to start out with some something that is exciting rather than, uh, you know, pushing the, uh, the kids to, 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 to study subjects they don't actually want to do. So they started with a science picnic, which was exciting and interesting. By the time it grew, they realized, well, it's not enough just to have, you know, little towels and, and food on the ground. We actually have to have a building because the interest is so high. So they started out with the first project uh, in 2009. So it took four years of planning and thinking. They got, I think, 80, 80 millions from Europe and 50 of local uh, funding. The first building was finished in 2014. And I think by now they're in the third stage. So this is by now the biggest uh, science center, not just in Poland, but everywhere else. But it had a very clear thing in mind. They were focusing on primary schools uh, and... Um, in high schools, and especially if so the kids would want to study the, the sciences in, in, in university. So they had a very clear auditorium and, and, uh, and social group in mind when they did it. And I think that's not the case with most of the time when we think, so who is this going to speak to? Who is this destination for? Why would they come? And if they come, how long will they, st how long will they stay here? You know, that's the kind of a user journey, what we call the kind of fancy word. Well, how will people actually use the product that we're making here? Would that be an exhibition or, or tourism truck, what have you? So Copernicus is another sustainable, again, that's a dirty word these days. That's another one of that uh, I think it uh, really deserves our attention of growth. 
So why some grow? They usually grow not because it's a one iconic, uh, expensive building, because there are people who, inf uh, who invest into thinking about the process. So the, I, I w in these days we call the ecosystem, which I think is a dirty word, I would say the soil. So you should really think in long and hard. Is popular music is going to actually change uh, the things around and will be a destination on a national level? And if, if, and if, if, if it has to be so, how will we actually display that? Music. Music is about experience. The last thing it wants to be is in a museum. I mean, I should have thought about that, but, or, or the, or the, or the uh, sustainability center in Yorkshire. So the soil. So does the area that you're making your activity in, or your product, or your destination, does the area itself lend itself to something? Does it suggest any actual need? Is there a pain that you're actually solving? So the Copernicus was actually dealing with that. They're saying, um, well, we have students that are not willing to study, and they don't want to, you know, take hard sciences. And once they address the students in Poland, in Warsaw, they were also able to gather people from Ukraine now, and Slovenia. They're also interested just to go there. They don't study hard science, not even Polish uh, citizens, but they now, now go there because it was meant for somebody, it was relevant for somebody, not, you know, trying to address everybody in the world. Number two, what we call the user journey or user-centric uh, design is basically attention. So pay attention uh, who you work with. Is there anyone else doing something like that? So that's the idea of, of, of network. Uh, and, and, and what I say is the, is the ensemble, again, we could say cooperation, because that's a dirty word again. I say uh, it's a, an ensemble, like you have to play an instrument in an ensemble and do your, do your part fairly well to be able to succeed. So the thinking from, again, the, I think there was a, there's a question from, uh, for, from the panel, um, uh, what would cooperation look like in 2013 if the Baltic Sea region tourism would, would, would flourish? And someone said, we probably don't even need European funding by then because the ensemble, the cooperation should be so strong that we're, we're sustainable, we can do it without it. So I think this is the kind of a planning from the future. If we are in 2030, like in Tarantino movies, you know, the scene starts with a dead body. And then you, you spend all an hour and a half seeing how did we get the dead body? You know, how did, how did the guy or the woman die? Right? So this is the thing of, of looking from the future to the now. What should we do so that in 2030 we wouldn't, we wouldn't be relying on another horizon or you know, Baltic Sea Interreg project, even that's great that we do. So the idea is about platforms. All of the projects I've mentioned, both Bilbao and, and, and uh, Copernicus, in their form and fashion are platform businesses. They are about, all about cooperation or vitamin C, something that's really vital uh, for development. And I'm going to talk about the project that I'm working in and for the last 18 years. That's in Riga. That's what I do in, in my day-to-day in my, in my, um, day -day activities. And it's, it's a small area in, in the city of Riga, which is around the biggest boulevard in Riga called VEF District. And it has seven biggest ICT companies in Riga coming together, again, in an ensemble, thinking that what they're doing right now is absolutely crucial for what, where they want to be in 2000. 30 or 25, and it's all about platforms. Uh, some of you perhaps drove here uh, by a taxi. You, the, you took, uh, took Taxify or Uber. Some of you have Google things that, or done something on Facebook. We are moving to platform reality, and not just speaking with each other in conferences, but also digitally. So these companies that we work here, they are thinking that in 10 or 15 years, the platform will, will be the only way we communicate. That doesn't mean we're not going to talk to each other, but it's going to be a platform. And the only currency that will matter in 10 or 15 years. Can I trust you to do the job that I'm giving you? And can you trust me with what I'm saying? The ev everything else will be nonsense. There's enough money, there's enough resources all around going, it's just, if it, can I trust you to do the job you're doing? And this takes the, the, the most energy in the world. I just came today, I just came from Barcelona, smart city, uh, Congress, the biggest smart city Congress in the world. It just fin it's still going on uh, until Thursday. And all the gadgets, you know, Dubai and Qatar and Sweden and, and Netherlands, all, you know, showing out their, uh, their gadgets that about smart cities. But if you ask, if you go up to any of those, you know, 70,000 euro booths that are in the expo, and if you talk to them for five minutes, they say, it's all complete nonsense. We have all the gadgets you can Im possibly imagine in the world. None of them work because there's so much friction and there's so much torpedoes from the city councils that don't want to take any uh, technology up on them that they're basically all just development stage. 
none of these things are actually working. See, they're all fancy sitting up there. No one's using them. They're just waiting for some idiot to buy them because they're, they're not going to work. You know why? Because nobody in the city department was ever involved in developing the technology, yet they're forced to buy them and operate them. And they don't even know how they work. They, they feel like they're stupid. So that's like the kind of a uh, dark secret of, of these expos. And it, 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 it's now taken to, fo to the point that the city of Barcelona has to brand Smart City Congress under the name of cities to live in. Because there is not a single architect or urban planner there. They're just technology geeks in the whole Congress. Not a single architect I met over, over two days. So basically, engineers and geeks are plotting cities for us. Well, no wonder the typical city council doesn't do anything with that. And it's all about one thing, the platform. Can I trust you to do the thing I'm asking of you, and can you trust me? And that's, you can go any city you know, as advanced as Netherlands or Copenhagen or, or uh, Zurich or anyone. They'll talk you one thing and, uh, when you talk to them with, with coffee. Can I trust you with your, your task? Everything else is just bells and whistles. So this is what we're doing in Web District, trying to create trust. Again, this sounds like you know, new age uh, religion, but it's not actually. These are hardcore ICT companies and they're understanding that unless there's trust, we won't be able to do this. So this is the biggest boulevard in, in, in Riga. And we're organizing ourselves under a 100-year-old uh, factory called VEF. And this is the VEF. It's been there for 110 years. It was the biggest electronics factory that survived the uh, World War I, World War II, communism, and now it's still running in different form and fashion. The companies that are there are basically standing on the shoulder. So why are we doing in, in, in this area? Because, again, because of the soil. There is history, there is a narrative, and there is an atmosphere around this area. When you say this area, and any of those of you who live in Riga or Latvia, people know where this is. So rather than going in the middle of nowhere in a green grass development, brownfield, we didn't think it was, it, was, it was pointless. Why would we go in the middle of nowhere? We went somewhere where there's a story. So in some ways, we're not even developing the district. We're just continuing the idea. This is a hard industry, and we're moving to light industry. So ICT, artificial uh, intelligence, uh, machine learning, and all those things that actually make, make the, these digital uh, disruptions work. So these are the seven companies that are in the area. It's like we, we call it Infinity Loop. This is the old VEF. Uh, you probably can't see that on, on the left side. And the new VEF that was sprang out in the 1960s, which is a cultural palace there that the engineers and workers used to go to and, and spend their free time to. So we realized that we shouldn't even talk about uh, the ICT and the future of IT because that's not, not even relevant. Most of the people that spend their eight hours in a day, they, have, they know what they're doing. What they want to do, and especially that, that resolves around the people who would like to join the ICT companies, how nice is the area? So you can, I don't know if you know anyone who works in ICT, it's a horror story now to hire anyone and work in an IT. Those people can ask you very high salaries and ask horrible demands and you still have to hire them because there's such a big demand from IT, ICT sector. So now what, what I've been, we, we've been talking with the HR sector now uh, is that young people come in these days and say, well, what does the area look like where I'm going to work? How is my office going to look like? And you could, you could Probably ten, day, ten years ago, you could kick that kind of person out of the, out of the loop because you know wh wh who do you think you are? You're 25 years old, and you're asking me how nice the area is. Where you're going to work? Well, are you are you on drugs or something? You know, you're supposed to do the job. You, you don't ask the questions of how nice the area is. But now we're come to the point where those people can actually choose where they're going to work in Berlin or Sweden or Finland. So they actually p pay attention to how nicely the area is fitted. So what we realize that the three and a half thousand people that work in, in in the area, they don't have um, and 2,000 people that live there, so it's basically 5,500 uh, 5 people that are around the area, they don't have a place to spend their free time. There, there's no single park. There's no green area. There, there, there's a very large boulevard, noisy boulevard, and also obviously polluted boulevard. They don't, they, don't, they don't have anywhere else to go outside and have a cup of coffee or, I don't know, have a conversation or, or jog in, in, their, in their afternoon. So we came up with the idea, even though it's an IT, ICT, district so we were supposed to run around with gadgets and autonomous cars and drones that's just nonsense again no one wants to do that that's not no that's not 2005 anymore people want uh, and you can just google you can actually google the google city and just imagine how google which is now obviously making cities as well not not just uh, you know advertising the green is down in the, the most common denominator for google or amazon cities they want the areas they, their workers work to be green 
So we came up with the idea that we're going to create the park as the heart and the center uh, of the place that we want to embody. And this is the this is the park which has been sitting there uh, since uh, this is the render on again on on the strip of the boulevard around where all the ICT companies are. These are some of the photos. Um, and the park uh, is a former cycling racetrack. And these are some of the pictures we, we've taken from there. It's, it's a beautiful area. So this is 1926 uh, when it was developed in, in 1970. So 100 years have passed and no one has taken it away. No one has put a shopping center there. No one has you know, uh, put it into a, a car wash or, or a gas station, which is unbelievable th uh, to my mind. These are some of the pictures from, from the old age. So we thought, how about we, make, again, use the soil and, and think about the park and think about the fact that that area has been available to the public, to the physical activities and, and free time activities for the people that work and live in the area for 100 years. And how about we continue in the track and the soil and the melody and the rhythm that has been in the place and make it into a destination. So that becomes the heart and the center of what we're doing. Rather than ICT or IT and gadgets and drones, we'll make the park at the center of it. And again, that we should build the trust. If we're able to build the trust, uh, if we're able to build a park for the people that work and live there, probably we can also build other things. That's the kind of crazy logic that is. If you can build something that is not necessarily a uh, requirement of, for your people, you can also do business together. That's why the billionaires you know, buy horses and, and trade football players and hockey players in Russia. So this is, this is what we think that the park is at the very center of the communities that we have there and how can they access there. So in some ways, the park becomes the address point, the facade. Like, you know, back in the middle, middle Ages, you had the key as a symbol of the, sea, uh, of the, of the city, or you had, or you had the, the gate, the, the, the passing from the country into the city, from one type of living and, and, and conversating into, into diversity and cosmopolitan area with different people, different backgrounds come together. And we think this, is the, this should be the center of the ICT district, even though not, that might sound a bit crazy. So, uh, more than 100-year-old trees that surround the, the former bike track create the perfect picture for, uh, for the current-day ICT person that would, instead of walking in, in his office back and forth on a phone for 45 minutes, now he can walk around. So, we obviously, we're not going to recreate the, the bike track because people are not cycling like that anymo anymore these days, even though they could. They, they're going to walk around in some peace and zen to, to have a decent conversation. So these are some activities we thought th the area should be available and interesting, not just in the summer, because the summers in Latvia are probably as short as in, uh, in the Nordic countries, you know, two or three months without rain. The rest is kind of gray like this outside. So we thought, you know, if there's snow left, you know, if we have snow in 2018, uh, um, then we, you can ski there, you can, you can skate there. If, if there's uh, cold enough, you can make a skating ring. Uh, you, can, you can make gym activities. People do jog, jog and, and do fitness in the cold as well these days. And in the summer, obviously, it's picnics for the people who work there and the people who live there. And also an area where you can actually make a public presentation on the right-hand corner there. Uh, if you know, one of the companies wants to do a PowerPoint, they can do outside in Lovely and play Batanga. So that's the render that we're hoping to have if we, if, we, if we get lucky. And again, so the soil is important, the, the companionship and working together is important, and building the model. You can, you can imagine that the companies we work with there, you know, they have lots of money. But we thought, how, how, what if we don't actually don't spend a lot of money on the park? We could spend a lot of money on the park. We could make it very fancy. But we thought, how, what if we actually retain the silhouette and the feeling of the park that was 30, years, uh, 30 and 40 years ago. So trying to be as little as intrusive as possible. To retain the trees, retain the shape, retain the form, retain just the very plain, plain grass. So it actually looks that it's historical, that people come together and come to a destination that looks like that, they're part of some bigger story. So I think building a model, you know, starting small and then building from there like Copernicus did in 2005 and now we have their three buildings there. I think that's the, what we would like to take from these iconic projects. You know, start small, make sure you can agree on that, you know, build small victories and, and then go ahead. And that's how you build the trust among the partners, which is the biggest thing. So in my last two minutes, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, again, try not to use the words that everyone's used before. So instead of 
speaking about, oh, try to cooperate. Well, that's such a nonsense word these days. Form a band, you know. Have some energy about what you're doing. What I heard is like 600 institutions, the panel which is now sitting in Facebook there, all the panel uh, panelists said, said there's uh, 600 institutions around Baltic Sea region that are dealing with things, so form a ban. You know, there's, there's 600 institutions is way too many. Form one, one interesting ban. Excel your role. So if you're playing an instrument, so to say, quote unquote, in, in the band, be good at what you're doing because people trust you. If, you, if you're going to do your part well, they're going to trust you. And if you fail once or two or thrice, and then the cooperation is just a buzzword and, and nonsense. And build, build models like the Copernicus did in Warsaw, and you can go check their case online. I think they're doing, doing a fantastic job, and they're still growing, and they're basically becoming one of the, 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 the pilots in, in, in the whole Europe of how to do educational research centers right, because most fail, spend money, and are just basically useless. So build models. St start small. Start a science picnic, you know quote unquote, rather than go big, like we're doing this, we're building a park. We could make a drone facility, we could make autonomous car facility to test drones, but that's so boring, everyone's doing it anyway. Start small, something that's actually exciting and, and, and good for the people who you're addressing, and create destinations. Think something that is actually historical, has a, has a story, has some feeling, and has something that people would, would want to go to. And as Jan Gale, uh, urban planner says, what differentiates abstract space from place is that you have many destinations. Rather than just going there for a job, but also you can go there for a job, you can uh, you do your laundry and stay there for coffee. That's a destination. That's what makes a city and the, the differentiates it from the abstract space. My time's out. Thank you. <laughs> you don't get away that easily, I'm afraid, Viesta, so I'm going to... Uh Shanghai you, can you please uh, come over, we'll, we'll sit down there. I'm not supposed to do a Q&A exactly, but I'm going to because that was, I think that was exactly what we need, particularly for the last uh, talk of the day, a bit of a kick up the back backside uh, with plenty of energy. I just wanted to ask you a couple of things about, first of all, this uh, iconic building syndrome. Yeah. It seemed to me from your description um, that there was nothing wrong with the buildings per se. What's wrong was the ideas behind them and that they seem to be basically a form of wishful thinking so we we wish that people in Yorkshire are interested in sustainable earth sciences whereas the fact is basically they're not the wishful thinking is well we can make them interested if we build a facility um, is that a fair assumption that really this is more of a case of building for some sort of psychic need rather than any practical need uh, in the community? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, and I, again, the, the sheer numbers and hard facts behind it are just stunning. You know, m most of these things absolutely go off, off the rails and it's just, it's just mind-numbing how many cities just go into this trap. And, and actually there are models that are working. So nothing, there's nothing against the kind of a popular uh, science center uh, in Sheffield, but how about make a festival? And the festival is popular, you know, is it, you know, there's a festival, and then that can grow a bigger festival, and then maybe that houses a building, or there's nothing wrong with sustainability. Mm -hmm. But how about making, I don't know, a conference, or a seminar, or kind of a gathering, and that grows, like that's what the people did in, in Poland, and that it did. If it works, it's a, if it's a model, if it's feasible, so. But so many people think these days that development equals a building. So if we want development, we have to have a building, which is complete nonsense, it's just, just insane. No one does that, no one does that. But usually, I mean, what does uh, get a fair amount of attention is when taxpayers' money is being spent in yeah. very large amounts and nothing's happening or the results are not basically worth the money. So why do we still have this Guggenheim effect? Because it's still uh, prevalent today. You know, people, people, even with things like the Contemporary mm. Art Center, which mm. is planned in, in Riga, we're talking about a Guggenheim effect yeah. as if there will be this sort of magic spaceship will descend yeah. and suddenly no. everyone will be really into contemporary art. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, you can, and again, as I said, 78% is a very optimistic picture. Some say it's 95. So basically you have one, <laughs> one chance to make it right and 95 chance you're going to fail whatever it is you're doing. Uh, and it, it, goes, it goes to say that I think sometimes people are just lazy. They think the building's going to do the job for you. 
because obviously it's more difficult to make a science picnic, it's more difficult to make a festival because actually it's a process that you have to do and it, you, you have to invest in it. So, and, and it's easier to think, well, building is going to do the job for me or tourism center or information. There's so many tourism centers and information. They're dismal places. Who wants to go to tourism center? Maybe in an maybe in airport, I do. <laughs> yeah, but I'm out of there in fi five seconds, as little as possible. Have you seen them, how, how fancy these they are, the tourism centers? Bloody hell. <laughs> Is there some sort of, uh, I mean, if people won't take massive overspenders oh, see, I, I, I can only say this because I'm not, <laughs> I have nothing to lose or gain from tourism, so that's why I'm loud mouth. And it's 5 p.m. anyway. You guys are tired, and you're waiting for your drink and your dinner anyway, so let's just not, you know. Yeah, honestly, I won't keep you much longer. Yeah, but we'll, I've, be, we'll I've, be done just in a second. I got him, so I'm going to keep him for a second. I mean, is there some sort of... Um, trigger switch or, or some sort of sign where, where during one of these projects something will happen, someone will say something, it will reach a stage, maybe the rhetoric suddenly changes and, and this, this is kind of a sign that something's going wrong and you should really back off or think twice. Yeah, well, I mean, the trouble is that the cases that I presented, not only they backed off, they got more money, <laughs> which is the kind of vicious cycle. Someone is like, well, we can't just let it be like that, so we have to give it more money. Maybe, maybe it's like, you know, the car is dead. How about we paint it? You know, well, there's still, still, it's not going to run if you paint it. You know, it's not gonna, like you change the wheels, it's going to grow. So yeah, I, don't, I don't think it works, and I, and I think by now the, the, the governments have learned the hard way that most of these things just die in two years and it's just a waste of, waste of time. So, and a lot of learning has been taken from digital era. So every time you Google something, just note on a downside it says beta which means that once you Google something, Google is learning from you how to do their business. And that's the whole thing. If you make a building, building's done. That's not a model. Bu building is done. It, it will take another five million to change the building. So you should always go with a process to something you can fold, change, and you know, do something different in, in next year. And the buildings don't allow that. They are the most hard way to make, uh, the most, that's the most expensive way how to learn is to create a building for your project. That's, you know, that should be illegal, I think, by now. Uh, turning to your, your VEF project, and I mean, VEF is a very, very interesting area, yeah. historically, yeah. geographically, and all these things. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're talking about uh, this wonderful mutual cooperation between these hard-headed yeah. business types. Yeah. Is there not some little part of you that thinks maybe that's a form of wishful thinking as well? Um, Yes, well, f I mean, yeah, I think it, it, it I mean, um, yes, in short, yes, I think it's wishful thinking, but if anyone of you do, those of you who live in Riga, that area is horrible. Four lanes of cars, basically, basically the biggest intersection in there. So last, that, the last thing that place needs is more drones and more self-driving cars. So if anything can change the, the feeling about it is that there's actually a park. And there hasn't, you can, it's, this is how, how crazy the city is. In 25 years, there hasn't been a single park that is being built along the biggest boulevard in, in this country. That's the backbone, they call it the backbone of the, of the city. Not a single park. What, what, how many, what, there's no wonder people leave the city for suburbs, whereas they, you know, I have my dog, my car, and my lawn that I can, you know, on Sunday mornings. You know, of course not. Well, that's, what, what do you think that is going to happen? And just to be clear, this will be a park which is open to all the of public, course. no restriction. We, just no, we don't even work. own a line. It's not like our park. Goodness hell, no, no, no. Well, that's it's what I wanted to ask. Who does actually own the, own the land? The, 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 well, this is where it becomes interesting. This, and and I, I'm not supposed to say this, but the land is owned by the, by the state, and they want to put a building, five-story building on, on, on top of it. So those who, you know, I can be fired for this, for saying that. So basically, there's a clash. They want a building on top of it. We're saying we want a park. So, yeah, well, I just said it. I didn't, I didn't show it. It was on the papers. I'm just, this is 5 p.m. I'm, I'm just talking. Okay, well, we'll I'll, I'll shut up now, but I'll give the final word of today to a couple of the uh, questions that we've had in on Slido, just to show that it's still working. Uh, what about Riga's signature building? I guess that means sort of what do you view it to be, or maybe there's a white elephant building as well. Uh, well, I think the, as far as tourism, the Art Nouveau district is doing the job. I'm, I'm happy it's doing the job. You know, people go there like crazy, but do, do local people go there? I don't know, and I think... The, yeah, the signature building. I, what I know from the, and I think it's not just about millennials, because that's a dirty word again. I think people from between 20 and 50, they don't want to go to the beaten track. That's why the Lonely Planet and Airbnb is so popular. And I, now you open up Airbnb, you can have a yoga, you can surf, you can trade local wine, you can go crazy dumpster diving, all sorts of things, because people are so bored of the usual trap, you know. 
cafes that are popular with locals. That's the probably the most Google thing. You go to Barcelona or Sweden or Copenhagen or El Estonia, you don't want to go to the public thing that is shown to you on the book like you go to an airport. You want something that's authentic and natural. So I think there's more room to actually experiment. I don't think we've experimented. I don't think we've done so many mistakes that we could say, oh, way too much experimentation. Let's go back to the classic mode. I think everyone's just doing the classic thing. And those who don't do the classic thing, those are, those are shine like bright like a star. And finally, how will this project uh, affect Latvian tourist arrivals so we can evaluate the result in 10 years' time? So basically, what, what do you think is going to be uh, in this park, in this district in 10 years' time? But from what you said about Copernicus, for example, yeah. I imagine it, it would be difficult for you to say that because hopefully it will be something completely different to what you originally started. Uh, yes and no. I think that the kind of what is called silo thinking. So thinking, tourism is here investments over here and it works over here and inhabitants are no it doesn't work like that so in VEFs we have three and a three and a half thousand people working out of which 800 are from all over the Europe and there's conference center so there are so there are, every week there's a conference international conference those people come there and the area is horrible so what so so what they came from conference if there's nothing to do there's no cafes there's no park there's no nothing so if they like the area because the, the conference, by the way, conference tourism is a big thing. What do the people see? They, end, they, they land in an airport, they take a taxi, land in a conference center, and take a taxi back to the hotel and come back, and then they're gone. So what about how can we even meet those people, the conference you know, spending buddies, is that perhaps there's a park outside of the conference center where the, you know, hell, a symposium is held. So I think we're not, e we're not even tapping in the conference crowd, which is apparently with the most, the most desired, because they spend a lot of money. Uh, so we have a lot, a lot of those people in VEF area, and we'll have even more, more uh, probably in, in two or three years once we grow. So that's why the park is actually not just for the inhabitants, for everybody. And we don't know. We, it's not like we're going to have tickets for the park. It's just saying, let's do something outside of the box for the IT crowd. crowd. But I'm, I've taken too much time anyway. Yeah, and speaking of which, we do have a lovely park outside here as well, which is also open to the public. So Absolutely. if you haven't had a walk around there today, uh, maybe during tomorrow's session you can take a, uh, take a, take a walk there. I'm, I, I can guarantee that the weather's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Um, right, so that just about wraps us up for today. Please, you might as well stay there for a second. Uh, all we've got now is a closing performance. Um, but before then, I've been asked to provide a bit of a summary, and rather than wax lyrical, because I'm already 15 minutes overdue, but I, I hope you'll agree it was worth an extra 15 minutes. I think if I've learned anything today, it's there's nothing wrong with being idealistic and aiming high, but also make sure you stay open to the darker side, to the problems, and don't just try and see things through rose-colored spectacles all the time. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, I've also been told that there is a craft workshop um, outside over near the doors. So go and try your hand at various Latvian handicrafts. Um, you might be it might be difficult to knit yourself an entire pair of mittens if you haven't been handed one. Um, but you can have a go and you can see some of the excellent uh, Latvian handicrafts which are available. The drinks I'm pleased to see are arriving already. I was originally told there would be 900 bottles of wine, but this was revised down to 900 glasses. So. Sorry about that, because I thought three bottles each would have been pretty good. And um, that's about it. So now I'll just call on Elzo Rosenthaler and band. And can we start the light show as well and release the Northern Lights? <laughs>